quorum. So welcome to Appropriations Committee meeting on uh, Thursday, March 28th. And uh, on our agenda, we have, uh, we have our public comment, if there's anyone from the public who wants to speak. Uh, otherwise, we have uh, the school committee here for discussion on the school budget. And uh, we'll, I don't know if we have any minutes to go over, but uh, and then we we'll may go over the budget a little bit afterwards. So is there any public comment? Okay, item number two, uh, the school committee. Uh, the schools, I don't know if you want to join us here. So do you have anything you wanted to present or before or just go over the budget or? Uh, we do have a really, really quick slide presentation. I think it should actually be on this desktop, they tell me. Does Terrific. Know what the password is? Password? Oh, does there need a password? The it's right there. It should be on the desktop. Okay. Oh, it's on the literal desktop. <laughs> oh, literal is right. <laughs> So we'll just go through this quickly. Uh, you have probably seen this a hundred times if you have been in tune to any of the school committee meetings or the Board of Selectmen meetings. We've been presenting these same slides all along. Um, so in constructing our budget for the year, um, obviously we want to keep our public schools very high ranking and you know at the same time um, you know, we really tried to stay to the budget message and, and you know, think very hard about the money that we had and the programs that we have and keep things intact. So I think that we met those goals pretty successfully. Um, I think there are places in our schools where we know that we have some, some capital needs that will need to be addressed in terms of growth. We know that there are things in our school that will fall into the operational budget, but for now, uh, we think that the budget that we've put together is um, one that certainly you know, honors kids, student safety, technology, improvement plans, all of those things were given careful consideration. Uh, so as I said, we did have some challenges. As you know, we had some markedly increased enrollment this year. Uh, the school department belongs to the Accept Collaborative, and Accept Collaborative helps us with transportation for some of our special needs students because one of the big budget drivers left that group uh, we were sort of left with a, a bigger bill than we anticipated, so we had to absorb $200,000 for that. Uh, we opened the Marathon Elementary School, and that's no easy feat. It might feel easy to just open the doors and welcome in 550 um, pre-K, K, and, and one students, but uh, there are some stumbling blocks along the way. Uh, we do feel like we have some growing transportation needs. Um, we were just in a meeting previously where someone said, but I look at my child's bus and there's only 30 students on it. And that can be true because of the geographic <coughs> footprint of the town and some of the long and winding roads. To get kids home in an hour's time, sometimes we can only put 35 students on a bus. Um, if we kept them on the bus for 90 minutes, we could be more economical in terms of the numbers, but we certainly wouldn't be student friendly. Um, and then, of course, we have unfunded mandates that, you know, challenge the budget all the time. So how did we get to where we are? We started out with a 9.9% ask. When all of the administrators came into a room, that's what they said that they, they would really need to keep their buildings afloat. So in the process, we did get rid of a few things. Uh, we got rid of uh, an FTE at the high school. Um, someone requested a K-5 to math coordinator, so at this point we're only putting that in at 0.5 for next year. We took away 0.5. Uh, we eliminated 1.0 FTE special educator. We eliminated a maintenance worker. We eliminated two technology positions. We eliminated a request for 0.02 benefits coordinator. 
Uh, we reduced our support staff requests um, to 2.8 from an ask of six. There was obviously attrition that has come to us from retirements and resignations, and that's actually been helpful in the FY19 budget. We had to restructure some of our personnel. We made some small reductions to our expense budgets, and then we got Title III money for the first time because our L numbers are so high. So that was a nice little bit of money for um, our offset there. Uh, this shows you the growth that we had in student numbers from October 4th to December 20th. We've been using the slide because it sort of falls in with the budget uh, season. And you can sort of see that we had, you know, even a little bit of growth during that time that, you know, 16 new kids came into the district in, in that small period. I point that out because our anticipated growth with this budget is that we will have 103 new students, and that came to us from a NESDEC prediction. Um, if we absorb those 103, it will be very easy to absorb them if they are evenly dispersed, so we get about eight kids per the 13 grade levels. If we have 30 kids who land on our doorstep who all want to enroll in grade six, we will certainly have an issue. Uh, not maybe dissimilar from the one we had in the middle school last year. We were creating uh, teams uh, in November, and that was um, certainly disheartening to families. So this year when we thought we were probably getting about 50 students, we ended up with 189 students. What I've done typically to illustrate the impact of that is to say that for about every 20 kids, I need 1.4 teachers. And that happens because we don't just need a second grade teacher, but we need a music teacher and an art teacher and an L teacher and a special educator and a learning specialist or all of those different um, roles that um, sort of fall into additional services just beyond classroom teachers. Uh, so this year we had to add about 9.8 or 10 FTEs, and, uh, and that's what we did. <coughs> We've also tried to be fairly responsible in terms of building budgets by looking at uh, developments in town that are slated for occupancy before June of 2019, and then again for June, th June 2020. Uh, so you can see that if each one of those households had only one student in it, we would probably be anticipating about 132 kids coming into the district. I know that's probably very small for you to see on that screen. Uh, we have taken out 20 students because uh, those new construction units are uh, age-restricted at Legacy. And I always just like to throw in a per pupil expenditure. These are the 2017 figures, and you can see that Hopkinton was spending $14,557.98 per student. And I guess when you look at us near districts that I think sometimes we like to compare ourselves to, uh, I feel like we get an awful lot of academic, um, social, emotional, extracurricular bang for our buck here. Uh, I like to include some performance highlights just so that you can see where we are in our uh, performance rankings in both ELA and math. MCAS, uh, the green boxes are where Hopkinton came in um, in the top 5%. The white boxes are where Hopkinton came in in the top 10%. And the peach boxes are where Hopkinton came in in the top 20%. Uh, so, you know, when we look at things like grade 4 math, we're very close to being in the top 10%. When we look at grade 7 ELA, we recognize there that we had um, some literacy issues and we've started to work to put people and um, programs in place to address those. Uh, but we are always very pleased to see our middle school math scores and our grade 3 um, ELA and math scores. They're always looking very good. This year, a really nice surprise was grade 5 ELA. Those numbers had been uh, much lower, and I think that Vanessa Bellello, the principal at Hopkins, has done a lot of work to bolster both ELA and math in that building. Do we have these numbers for the higher grades for high school? Uh, yep, you'll see that right here. Um, so some of the high school performance ones, I've just taken those out <coughs> because they obviously get way more accolades, but they get way more accolades because they're available, not because you know they do better than the other schools. So. Um, in terms of SAT scores, we were ranked 18th statewide in both reading and math. Uh, 
89% of the students at the high school earned a passing score, either a three, a four, or a five, on over 1,100 AP tests that we gave last year. 100% of our students earned proficient or advanced on the ELA MCAS in 2018. Uh, that's pretty amazing not to have any student who was not proficient or advanced. 97% of our kids earned proficient or advanced on the math MCAS in 2018. The state gave out uh, School of Recognition awards this year for the very first time, and Hopkinton High School was one of four high schools in Massachusetts named by the commissioner. There were only four, and we were one of them. And in Boston Magazine, we're in the top 20% among the best high school districts, um, best public high schools in Massachusetts. So things to celebrate at the high school for sure. And I will let Susan talk a little bit about these budget slides. Thank you. Um, so as you know, back in the fall, we were given a budget guidance um, of a 6.5% increase. Um, so there was a lot of work that went in from September until even just recently, we made even further reductions um, and came in at a 6.63%. So this slide just basically gives you a very quick overview. Typically, as you know, a um, school district is a service industry, so it is always very high in terms of uh, the payroll percentage. So our payroll <coughs> is 80% 80, 80 of the entire budget. Um, so a lot of times when we have to make adjustments to the budget, it does hit that, uh, that payroll line. So the personnel, as Dr. Kavanaugh spoke about the increase in the number of students that came in FY19 that were not expected and not budgeted for for the FY19 budget, these are the positions that we needed to add during the school year, and these are the positions that are being carried forward into the FY20 budget. So as a for instance, some of the positions that we added during FY19 were um, instructional assistants at the kindergarten level because of the numbers that came in. However, for FY20, those instructional assistants were, uh, re re were then cut and an additional teacher was put in place. So while we had to do what we needed to do during this fiscal year, uh, then moving forward, we put in a more sustainable model, which really was a teacher in the, in the first grade. So these are the positions that will be carried forward into the FY20, again, to address the um, student population that came in. The additional asks, and again, as Dr. Kavanaugh um, on the previous slide, we originally started at a 9% ask from the buildings to address the students that were in front of them. We reduced what those asks were, but these are the positions that we still felt going forward we needed to address the population of the kids. And as a for instance, those uh, instructional assistants at the kindergarten level were eliminated, but a teacher was added, um, to, again, to address population. So knowing that we're still trying to work at that guidance, we looked at all the positions uh, district-wide and we reduced um, existing positions in order to get within that, uh, that guidance. So you can see a literacy coach, a reduction of an assistant principal, a librarian, guidance secretary time was reduced from 12 months to 10 months. We reduced one English language learner looking to use that Title III money that, it, that we received, um, a special ed learning specialist, and a special ed coach. <coughs> and this just gives you a side-by-side -side, uh, look at the personnel increases in 19 and then the personnel decreases and compared also with the FY20 budget and just gives you that total budget impact. Do you have a number, like a total number, too? I do not, I could add them, but I just don't know if you add them off the top. The FTEs? Yeah. I, I don't have that off okay. the top. I, I my, apologize. I'll just do the math. <laughs> yeah, sorry. If I had my phone, I'd do it real quick. But. For, for the, excuse me, for the partial, the partial heads that are being added and eliminated, are we shifting the same folks to a new role? Is that how we're coming up with the partials? Or? 
Do you mean where it says something like 0.5 yes. learning specialist? Yes. So, for example, in FY19, we had a 0.5 learning specialist in one of our schools, um, and that was all. She worked half time, and she decided that she no longer wanted to work at all. So she was, you know, somebody who left our employ, and we took her caseload and redistributed it among the special educators who were already in that building. Okay. So if she had five people, someone might inherit three, someone might inherit one, someone might inherit one, and that was it, right? Okay. So that's one example of, of sort of what happens. Um, a point three teacher for the visually impaired, for example, that's the amount of time we need that person to be working with the child. So that's why we keep that number um, as it is. You know, we only put people in places as we need them. Um, a point three librarian, we had somebody who was working, point seven classroom teacher, point three librarian, and so that's why you see a lot of pieces. Okay, and one other quick question. Which actual set of numbers did, so the NESDEC seemed a little low, and I've seen, I know in one of your other slides you looked at the, the potential impact coming from the, the new growth. Mm -hmm. Which number did we, like did you build your budget on? We sort of really went with that 103 number, right? Um, and NESDEC the year before had said to us we would probably have about 50 kids, and that's when we ended up with 189 of them, right? So this year we have been sort of building the aircraft in flight, so to speak. Uh, but, you know, sort of as we have looked at that 132 and then the 103, so we say we built it on 103 as long as we're putting in eight, but, you know, truth be told, we could probably put 10 in each one of those those grade levels before we reach that sort of breaking point where we would need to add an educator. Uh, my greatest fear is that we will have, and you know, we've said this last year, we had uh, 64 kids came into kindergarten unaccounted for. Um, and then we had an enormous number of kids in grade six, and then another big number if you combined grade eight and grade nine. And what that sort of tells us is that families are moving here for the whole K to 12 experience, or the secondary experience, or just the high school experience. Right? That's sort of where they have landed. Uh, and you know, the, it should not have come as a huge surprise to us because we had families calling very frequently saying, you know, my child just finished fifth grade in this community and we really want him or her to start in grade six so that, you know, they are with their peers all the way from six to 12. And, you know, once they had established res residency, we just kept registering them. And then all of a sudden we had a lot of kids. Thank you. <laughs> and the last piece to the budget um, are really the expense changes. So you can see really the, the big drivers are um, central office, which is transportation. So that represents our um, transportation contract. And we did add one additional bus. Um, and as we said earlier, what you're seeing in terms of capacity on a bus, you have that mix of the number of stops and the time constraint. So our buses and our bus routes are all running at capacity in terms of the number of kids and getting between the schools either within that hour or within the half hour which is between the dismissal time of um, the middle school high school to Hopkins so in order to make all those work um, we do need an, an additional bus for next year um, curriculum, that is really the textbooks. There's a new um, eighth grade civics um, curriculum area that has been added. The athletics in, and regular education you can see are very small numbers. Building and grounds is really our utilities. So bringing on Marathon, we were using an estimate even for this year of what was um, put out by the engineers. And what we're seeing is that is not coming true. So we uh, increased the estimate for the um, utilities at Marathon. And until we get some real-time experience, probably over two years to really normalize between commissioning and, and real use what those util utilities will be. So those utilities did go up at Marathon. We also used a one-time rebate in FY19 for salaries. Um, so that's why it looks like an, an extraordinary increase in that, uh, in that budget. And special education, we used the um, transportation money that was prepaid also to support salary 
um, the positions that needed to be hired in FY19. We also had an increase in the accept transportation assessment, as we spoke about earlier, and some of our tuitions. Um, we had some students that moved in this year. With the move-in law, you don't actually pay that tuition, um, depending on the time of year that they move in. But next year, we will be responsible for that tuition um, based, on, based on that law. So the special education number looks high. Um, but again, half of that number went to pay for the positions that we ended up hiring in FY19. I don't, I don't understand that piece. Um, all the positions from FY19 or just those related to special ed? Any position that we had to hire. It was basically moved, transferred into the salary lines. Okay. So how does that increase the special ed number for the coming year? Because, tra because we had prepaid the transportation in FY18, we did not need to spend that money in FY19 on transportation. On special ed transportation? That's correct. Okay. For this increase in special education, is there a s impact with the circuit breaker? I guess, does that come in next year? So if the if special ed is accelerating are we always a year behind in uh, terms that's of the correct we're, we're always a year behind so we have normalized our if you recall for the FY19 budget we pulled way back in the amount of special education I mean um, circuit breaker revolving that we were using towards the budget we were using about 600,000 um, to offset the budget but our receivable was only 300,000 so we pulled back to normalize and create a sustainable um, mechanism going forward so we will always be a year in, a, in arrears of any increase but it is lined up with what the potential um, the estimated revenue will be are you projecting a similar amount to be funded I mean, as far as you know the percentage amount or um, I did not incre I'm staying uh, conservative yeah. on, on that um, we don't we won't know what the actual percentage will be until the budget is finalized which in a lot of cases is july right yeah yeah okay. and governor baker was suggesting more money for education um i don't know if anything was targeted and i know it's just the governor's budget so um be interesting to see what happens <laughs> right yeah that's correct and and anything that happens as far as um you know the governor's budget and as it further marches down the road what they're looking at right now or what the government the governor is proposing is kind of that relook at the chapter 70 but he's looking at a seven year run rate in yeah. terms of implementation there is indication that maybe somebody else may change a little bit of that may make it a five-year run rate but some of the things some of the buckets may go up and down mm -hmm. so there really is no telling again until the the final budget is passed where we'll end up yep. What was the fiscal 19 impact uh, for those new hires? The seven, I know you show, you're showing 744, but I'm, it looks like that's their impact in fiscal 20, not 19. That's correct. Hold one minute. So the full fiscal impact um, for this year is 576,000. So keep in mind, obviously, positions were hired at different times during the year. Mm -hmm. um, so if something was hired um, halfway through the year and is a position that is carrying forward, while the fiscal 19 impact is only a half year, fiscal 20 is a full year. So not so that entire the the entire impact of those new hires wasn't absorbed by SPED, just a portion of it. That's correct. Okay. That's correct. Mm -hmm. Yep. Thanks. <laughs> Questions. Uh? So the uh, 
the impact or the increase is 6.63 percent. The target initially was 6.5 percent, but then the Board of Selectmen asked the overall budget get down to 2.5 percent. Is this number stick able to stick? I guess this is more for the town manager, uh, Norman Kamalo. Is, are these the numbers that we can go to town meeting with at this point? If I may answer through a question, do these numbers reflect the latest iterations? Yes, yes they, do. they do. Yeah. And the answer is yes. Okay. Anything else with the operational budget, or do we want to go to uh, capital articles? Um, so the ability, the ability to get through fiscal 19 um, with all these new students without asking for any money was really predicated on being able to use SPED money and kind of shift it over. And now, instead of paying it this year, we pay it next year. That's correct. OK. Um, what, what, was, what was the full? What, just, I know it's all kind of ballpark, but um, total impact of the new students. For the, the positions that were hired? The, the unanticipated students. No, everything, all in. I mean, I don't know, if, you probably mentioned it, but did, you know, did we have to get a new bus or a couple new buses on routes? And, you know, and then there's the students themselves and you know, everything else. <coughs> so, the, I mean, the only, in addition to the positions, um, was the bus. Um, okay. You know, there probably were some, you know, minor adjustments in textbooks that would be purchased. Uh, a lot of textbooks are online licensing, you mm -hmm. know, so I, I don't think that has a huge budget impact. No, and it would probably land in the technology budget. Right. Some do, yeah. yeah. I so think the number might have been about 780,000. It was on one of these slides, wasn't it? Yeah, the he, personnel. he was looking for beyond, beyond the personnel. I see. Yeah. Yeah. Comprehensively. So it would be what some end up being over 780 or beyond it would be beyond the, just the personnel increases yes okay and there were if I'm not mistaken some move-ins that were out of district placements as well that we had to absorb or that required additional supports and any of the move-ins that were in in and out of district placement we if they were if they moved in um, and were in district, then they would have been captured with that personnel increase. If they moved in and they were out of district, unless it was a collaborative placement, we fall into that move-in law where we don't have to pay for them until fiscal 20. So an increase in some of those out-of-district tuitions is attributed to some of the new students that we don't have to pay for until 20 mm -hmm. because it's an out-of-district placement. So that's true. We could be adding that number on as well. Okay. Um, and then now the other, that other unanticipated cost for the, what was it, access? The, the accept. Oh, accept, I'm sorry. Mm -hmm. I was going to go back and look at the early slide, but that would have taken too long. And that was another 200,000? That's correct. Yeah. So altogether this year you had, you absorbed over a million dollars in unanticipated costs? Well, the accept really is uh, an FY20. That was not something that impacted us in FY19. Okay. Yes. Okay. All right. Um, so if this same scenario happens, so this year it sounds to me like you were able to kind of shift things around because we had been prepaying a lot of things, and now you said, okay, we're not going to prepay. We're going to shift this money over to here, take care of these expenses. It's got to. It's got to happen. Um, if it happens next year, to me it sounds like. We're pretty much screwed. I would call it untenable, yes. Okay. <laughs> You're much more politically correct than I am. <laughs> um, okay. Thank you. <laughs> uh, somewhat late. Would, would it page. be possible to go back to the slide that showed the, I thought it was a great slide, the estimate of, of um, estimate of increased uh, new children due to the growth? Not the not the uh, NESDA. The one with all the uh, neighborhoods. Yes. The new I home see. projections. That one. Slide seven. Yeah. yeah. And it was 103, I think, is what the. Uh... Right. So what we've done is, 
in that first column, there are all of the developments. And then they tell you if they're condominiums or a single family. And the ones that are estimated to have occupancy permits by June of 2019, uh, what we've done is we have sort of said what would happen if one child moved into each one of those houses. And if one child moves in, the number of students who would be added to the schools would be 132. And that would be assuming that they are all school-aged children, yeah. right? I mean, if a child moves in who's two, obviously that child would not be going to the public schools yet. Have we done any modeling? Is any modeling out there of kind of like the average children per unit that's already um, in those new? I, I, I guess I'm a little concerned that we could see another great increase. So one of the things we have also done is, uh, and this is really not scientific, but it's been helpful is to reach out to the welcome wagon people because they they go and they knock on the door and then they find out how many kids are living there and are they school aged or are they preschool aged or do no children live there? And so her data has been a little bit helpful in helping us to sort of understand, yeah. you know, how many kids are, are actually moving into sort of which neighborhoods, right? And the data she's been giving us is also helpful in that it shows us which neighborhoods are turning over. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So that doesn't represent, this chart doesn't represent. That's correct. It does not the have the welcome wagon data in, the in there. The late 90s that are now, people are flipping them, yeah. I would say if you looked at the welcome wagon data, it would be, you would be a little more alarmed. Yeah. There would be more, more kids. Right. What happens, I know you said, you, you showed us um, enrollment, for, I think it was October 1st, which you know is when the state has you tell them enrollments, but then you had people move in afterwards. Mm -hmm. So I'm assuming the, the um, state aid is based on that October 1st. So now that we have a lag because you've added more students, we have to pay for them. And I'm assuming that date is October 1st. Do you get that money that same fiscal year or does that follow through to the next year? Mm -hmm. So the October 1 number mm -hmm. is, is what the state aid is based on. For the, for the fiscal, well, for fiscal year 19. So then we have a lag. Now we're carrying we have these a lag students without aid for those. Yeah. <laughs> it's just mm -hmm. worth pointing out that we're also carrying that up, you know. There, there was some discussion on when the um, hurricane, you know, mm -hmm. displaced so many students. Yep. There was some discussion on looking at a different date, say in like March, um, but I don't think that has gone anywhere mm -hmm. at this time. Okay. Any other questions on the operational budget? Um, yeah, one second. Yeah, I'm all set. Thank you. I have one general question. I know that the school committee has guidelines as to how um, many students in a classroom. With this budget and this um, staffing, are you still within those? Or are you going to have classrooms that are larger? Or, or where are you um, with your average class size? In building this budget, mm -hmm. we, we think we're in a place where all of our class sizes are you know, sort of where we would want them to be, but there are uh, beyond some sort of danger points, right? So, for example, you know, looking at Hopkins, you know, if there's an enormous number of kids who find their way to the Hopkins Elementary School doorstep, some of those class sizes could get big. Right. quickly and then this year we had you know pockets of so an advanced algebra class for example suddenly we had five of those with 30 kids in them mm -hmm. and obviously at the high school level it's easier to mitigate because at the the mid-year point all the kids will switch into a new schedule so you can add a teacher there seamlessly right right okay but that was very difficult to do in November in the middle school mm -hmm. So, but otherwise, you're, you're trying to keep them within the, um, the guidelines pretty much. We are. And just because of sort of the unreliability, like we don't, you know, we may know we're getting 103 kids, but we don't know which grade levels. So it's very hard to predict where you're going to need teachers. Exactly. So can I just clarify, because there's, there's a number out here. Um, it's, it's around the personnel, the personnel impact. And I'm sorry. It's on uh, slide 16. I just have to wait for this thing to 
leave the bottom of the screen. So it's saying uh, the impact is 424,000. But really, if we're looking, if we're looking from what the approved budget was for fiscal year 19 through to fiscal year 20, the difference ends up being around 1.2 million, right? Because we've got the the unanticipated people from fiscal 19 plus the new anticipated people mm -hmm. from fiscal 20 and then minus some other you know handful of, of positions so it ends up being around a 1.2 million dollar impact from last year to this year mm -hmm. or the coming year okay um, and that's anticipating that all of our numbers are right for next year which nothing against you guys because nobody can predict them but we haven't seen a lot of luck in that area <laughs> they yes. never come in lower <laughs> right exactly <laughs> <laughs> all right thanks so what was the increase just because of contractual obligations yes is there a number in addition so if you just took the same, you know, so that would say if you just didn't add any positions that part of this increase is just contractual obligations. Is there right. a number in there? Oh, no, I didn't. I didn't call that out specifically. I apologize. Because essentially that would give us the cost of, if there was no growth in the schools, for, you know, in the population, and that would say this is how much was due to the increase. And that would come out, should come out close to what Tasa Stari is saying about the, uh, mm -hmm. you know, the 1.2, it, it should be the difference, basically. Right, that's one thing I think people don't necessarily recognize as a result of this presentation is that teachers will have COLA raises, step raises, lane changes, mm -hmm. and, you know, we obviously enter into bargaining with custodians, cafeteria workers, everyone, so there are all of those raises in there as well. So both Rebecca and myself, we sat through many of the uh, uh, school committee meetings where we discussed the budget. So we're aware of the pain going from, was it 9.9% 9 .9 down to 6.6%. I know it was difficult. Mm -hmm. I will just say, for another $62,000, you could come in like rock stars and hit the 6.5. <laughs> What's 62000 out of a $48 million budget? math teacher <laughs> the same. oh you got to put it that way huh? <laughs> make it make it a person wow. <laughs> all right I think we're ready to go on to the capital your capital articles Is there a slide deck for that I was that just going to ask, yeah. Or, yeah. Is there something we can be looking at for that? So we have a page from the handout we received in the mail earlier in the week. That is the budget that has all everybody's capital articles on it. That's what I'm looking at. So the last page. What's the name of the file? Or is it just in the handout? Do you have the name of the file? Uh, the name of the file is 325 Budget Package Update. Thank you. It's the last page in yeah. version 2. Thanks. We're not doing this. Thank you. Yes, each project. Okay, okay. We'll deal with that. They have that. Okay. Would you like a copy of this? Yes, we were just saying we don't know what you have in front of you. So I'm sure you have a different format. Right. Thank you. That's got, I think, everything in there. Typically, I guess we would like a little more information on each, you know, we just have here's the cost, but sometimes we have a, a write-up on, on each item. Okay. You, you, have, you have those folders, they were sent back in February, January, February. Okay. I can speak through them quickly yeah. if okay. you would like. Okay. Um, so I'll go based on, because what I have on mine is different, but I'll go based on the order that is mm -hmm. in the packet that you received. Um, so the first one is the school capacity study for 50,000. 
and basically what we're looking to do is look at all buildings look at um, classrooms number of classrooms grade configurations and then again looking at growth and what can we do where can we be creative where will we have the most immediate need for a portable classroom or some kind of build out um, and then as as you know we have the statement of interest in front of the um, MSBA for the Elmwood school again uh, we don't know where that will go um, but this capacity study will give us a little bit of a look um, in terms of what can we do with our current facilities and what rooms are what would we need to do uh, the wetlands order of conditions this is an outstanding order of conditions actually from when you built the fields at the high school back in 2000 I believe or 1999 um, so we do have an engineer now that is putting together the replication um, that needs to be done to satisfy that and this is an estimate the hundred thousand was an estimate that was given to us um, by an engineering company at the time we've reduced that just to try to move along with town meeting um, we don't have that solid number yet at this point in time so we're hoping um, because it was um, decreased from a 2 to 1 to a 1.5 to 1 on the wet when on the replication that hopefully we can come in at a, at a better number so is this a hundred thousand or forty thousand it's forty thousand okay we reduced it we reduced the ask um, the next one is the roof engineering we are looking to get the engineering done for the middle school and some of the high school um, to get those uh, roof replace or uh, I apologize Hopkins um, these are the roof sections that have not been done at this point in time so middle school and Hopkins Hopkins okay that's correct the next is the data center replacement and this is a shared article with the um, the town this is really the the guts of the um, the connections for all of the internet and, and everything that goes um, handles both the school and the town the boiler replacement this is going to be a process where we're beginning to replace a line of boilers at the middle school the high school um, the middle school has two boilers the high school has five and Hopkins has one boiler that would be further out but that system actually runs as a lead lag so that boiler right now is not the one that is running all the time so we have more time to be able to replace this um, so that would be what that would be kind of a process that we'll be doing over the next couple of years I'm so, sorry which school is this again uh, it, middle school so this one so the ones for this year are related to the middle school only middle school okay. yes The next piece is uh, district-wide facility improvements and these are a combination of building and grounds equipment HVAC equipment and flooring throughout the district um, that is combined into one article Can we get a breakdown of what sounds what pretty it is? diverse <laughs> it is diverse um, originally it was Put out as 85,000 for building and grounds, 45,000 for HVAC, and 40,000 for flooring. That was the original article that we collapsed into one. And all these are for middle school. I'm sorry. All these are for middle school. For throughout all the district, yeah, all the schools. What, what kind of things are included included in the building and grounds component? Is that for the buildings or is it equipment to uh, maintain the buildings so uh, one of the things is a line painter for the fields to, to give you an idea so it's it's a, a variety of equipment so currently our line painter is basically not working it clogs all the time so this would be to replace that line painter is that it is, is that it is all the list I think there were some tractors and some other there's the there's uh, floor machines the, the 
machines that clean the floors in the in the buildings. Mm -hmm. The next one is kitchen equipment. So you can, this will continue to start replacing. Um, we have many pieces of equipment in the kitchens that are either not functioning or don't function well. We have ovens that don't hold temperature. Um, we have steamers that don't work. And we have walk-ins where the compressors and condensers go down and don't hold temperature. So we replaced some this year, and this will continue that process um, moving forward. So is this for new equipment or to fix the stuff that's not New working? equipment to replace it. And the last piece is a special education van. Um, currently, we have one van right now that is shared between the life skills program in the high school and the 18 to 22 program to take them out <coughs> to vocational opportunities. Um, the number of students has grown to the point and the placements in the vocational opportunities has grown to the point that we really need that uh, additional vehicle so that the students can get to um, all their opportunities. Does that require an additional driver or do one of the uh, teachers serve as a driver? That's correct, yeah. Teachers. So the, the teacher that uh, accompanies the kids on these vocational outings, it um, has a 7D license and okay. would drive the van. Mm -hmm. I believe that's all of ours. Oh, I apologize. <laughs> nope, they're down below. Um, so down in the capital, um, the school bus parking lot um, for an additional 300,000. You recall the last year's town meeting, we asked for 400,000. Um, in the time that we went through the uh, various boards and actually put out to bid, the actual costs were coming in higher. Um, some of that had to do with the requirements, the stormwater requirements that we needed to do for that location. Um, this is to bring the buses so that they are parked behind the school and we can take them out of the traffic that is in the front of the school. If we looked at the, I know that we're also doing this to, to save some money to get some excise tax and avoid the cost. Have we looked, given that we've now more than doubled the cost, if this is still a cost effective approach or? So it will bring in about 50000 in excise taxes annually, and we um, were able to negotiate a decrease in our contract of 50000 mm -hmm. So that would be a $100,000 financial impact. Okay. Um, per year, yeah. And not a lot of maintenance, too. And once it's built, it's built. So once it's yeah. built, it's okay. built. That's correct. <clears throat> And then security camera installations. This is to continue um, the build out of the security cameras that are campus wide, um, both interior and exterior, and just continue to get at the, the blind spots to um, protect the campus. And in answer to that safety and security audit that was done uh, about five years ago. So these are essential from what we heard about. Um, the other day, Norman and Tim, these are, these are these are cameras in addition to the ones that we discussed with um, buildings and grounds. Was it Josh or was it? Yeah, it was Josh. Josh. Who was it? Josh. Yeah, it was Josh. Josh. Yes. Library yep. cameras. So these are more. Center. So we've got a lot of cameras going on. Okay. Yep. So is this in addition to what Josh asked, or? Yeah. Yes. There's overlap. Okay. Um, I think as in past years, the I think the last two or three years, the school has had a separate article regarding security, mm -hmm. uh, and we continue the same trend this year. So we have a request from the schools and a request from the town side. Okay. With and that safety and security audit was townwide. It wasn't just the school. It, it addressed the, the town buildings as well. So mm -hmm. it probably had a call for that in there mm -hmm. as well. Is there an, any chance either as a result of the growth we're experiencing or some other factor that where we're putting the school bus parking lot, you know, five, six years down the road, we're going to be thinking, boy, you know, we could be using that space for something else or we should be. Well, we, I'll let Dr. Kavanaugh speak to it because we have looked at the building in terms of 
Yeah. Yeah. At this point, so one one of the things that we have thought about, uh, if you go to the high school tomorrow, you will see that in the faculty parking lot, there are not enough spaces to accommodate the number of teachers who park there. So you have teachers parking all along the perimeter in places that aren't really parking spots. Uh, one of my hopes would be that when you're able to park and stage the buses in the back, you could take that bus loop and turn that into additional parking. So maybe at some point we could have kids parking on one side, the parents <coughs> picking up in the loop, and then teachers parking on another side so that we could really isolate those two groups. Right now what happens is when the, the parents are coming in to drop students off, uh, we have kids who are just walking, you know, kind of clean across that, that parking area. So if we were able to build walkways, maybe that would alleviate some of that student and traffic, you know, in those, those, those areas that I, I think are sort of very dangerous. The other thing is we've looked at some of the lots that are behind the high school. So H lot, for example, is short now and it's down by the turf field. And a concern uh, with the turf field is you have people coming to use it, but there's not a whole lot of parking back there. If H lot could be extended, you know, that might be able to take, say, all the juniors off the, the front of the, the, the campus and move all the juniors to the back Monday to Friday and then use those parking areas for people using turf field in the weekend. But I do see in the future that we are going to have to do something about expanding parking at the high school. Um, it, there's just not enough spaces to accommodate student drivers and faculty drivers at this point in time. But with I guess, but with this new bus parking lot, though, is there any chance that we're going to build this and five years from now we're going to say, you know, that's been great, you know, we saved $500,000, um, but we really need this, this land to, I don't know, expand the high school, you know, or, or something like that. Or all of a sudden, whatever we do here is going to be on. Well, so the other thing that we, you know, we just... Uh, met with someone who had been on the high school uh, building committee you know, 20 years ago because there's been all these conversations about whether or not you can add classrooms to the back of that building. We did see in the drawing that there is a place where you can add six classrooms to the back of that building. Our guess at this point, and I, I almost regret saying the number out loud because I don't want people to think that there's any science or math or RFPs or anything that would have gone with that. But our guess might be about $750,000 per classroom and those would be classrooms that wouldn't be MSBA re reimbursed. But I think what would be very nice about having those buses staged back there, and I think we could accommodate up, up to about 33 on that, on that parking lot, um, is that when kids are leaving the middle school and high school, uh, they can walk down in between those two buildings and, you know, come right out to that bus parking lot. So I think it feels now like it's a very good idea. If you ask Mr. Bishop who uses Field 9 right now, where the bus parking lot is going, uh, he'll tell you it's really too small a parcel of land to, you know, sort of emulate any kind of game on. So you couldn't actually have sort of a field hockey scrimmage or anything like that there. So now no one uses it. I mean, kids might go out and do a little ultimate frisbee or something just for fun, but essentially no one's really using that piece of land. So and I, I don't have qualms about turning yeah. it into a bus parking lot. And those six classrooms would not be where the parking lot's going to be? Is that a separate? Correct. It would be attached okay, yeah, that's, to the back that's of the building. Yeah. Okay. yeah. It's, it would be two stacked on Right, three. exactly. They no, I know, because they added the six at the very end. But, but it wouldn't be in the same yes. footprint as the parking lot. It would not. It's, right. If you look at the back of the high school, you, you know how there are like two little things that, that sure, jet out? Yeah, it's a little bit not scientific. But <laughs> one is longer than the other because, like yes. Rebecca has said, it already had the six classrooms added on during the construction of the high school. Mm -hmm. The second set of six classrooms that was added on would just make those two even. Okay. Thank you. I, I have a one question. and, and um, not looking for an answer, but you've got a couple of projects you, you mentioned, both the um, kind of the HVAC, the buildings and grounds, and how you're in a maintenance program now to keep those, you know, staging it, as well as the kitchen equipment. Is that better put into an operational budget, or I don't know, Norma, if we're going to do that under pay as you go? It seems like I wouldn't want to, you know, if it's an ongoing expense in kitchen, you know, I don't think you want to borrow for kitchen equipment. Um, just curious as to how where's the best place for that I, ideally I it would be yeah. good to get it into the operational budget so 
in 2019 mm -hmm. when we were trying to get down to that budget guidance, mm -hmm. we actually pulled some of these projects Research. out and yeah. put them into a capital article just so that we could get there. Mm -hmm. um, ideally, some of those do belong back in the operating budget. Funding, we're just not there yet. Yeah. Um, so in, in taking care of some of this backlog, you know, mm -hmm. it, at some point in time we'll get in a better place. Yeah. Um, so that we can answer to these in mm -hmm. in the yeah, operating budget. budget yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I was wondering, uh, it seems like you had a lot of thoughtful analysis about the parking lot, but uh, did you go through any architect or in design process to identify the most, um, I think, uh, logical and convenient logistics-wise spot, A, and B, in the long run with the growth that we are expecting, how does it kind of fit into the overall plan going forward? Uh, so we did. We actually just did a presentation to the school committee. Um, to a couple years ago, we started out really as a master plan and looking at campus-wide. Um, and some of the parameters were around the uh, safety of students. Um, they're, they're walking two parking lots that were way down at the bottom of the loop road. Um, walking through bus traffic, parent traffic, um, but also looking at that full build out. So we did have a um, traffic engineer uh, look at all those things and give us different options. And we looked at all different places where we could potentially put the bus parking lot and where we ended up really seemed to be the, the best and the safest location. And even with the build out of the school, it maintained the emergency access roads, which were very important to both the police and the fire department, and did increase the, uh, you know, the safety of students walking both to their cars, to their parent cars, walkers, bikers. Um, it just really separated the traffic, which was, which was a big goal. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. And uh, another question related to the security camera. Uh, I think a couple of years ago there was a program that uh, um, the school was preparing to comply with LISA, uh, was it? The overall, I think, safety security program nationwide. Uh, so I was wondering, is this um, security camera related to that, or it's a uh, ad hoc found out based on the media, um, recent assessment of some kind? Uh, so it is, an, it is an assessment of the campus. The interconnectability is something that we would be doing not only for the schools, but for the town and then town by town. Um, so that's unrelated to the cost for this. That's, that's an interconnectability. I don't know if um, Mr. Kamalo can speak to that more, but that cost is, that's not what this cost is for. Oh, okay. That's a, that is a different program. I see. Yes. And in related to that program, do you think you are at par with the nation's average or? We need to do more in the coming years or even now? I think we're getting closer in terms of our build out of the cameras and what you'll see going forward will be replacements because we did start the implementation of some of these cameras years ago and now it'll just be the, the maintenance um, going forward. Okay, good to know. Um, another question was related to the kitchen equipment and education van. I see um, the recommendation came about half of that. Uh, how did we came about kind of changing the numbers and is this adequate? How do we know that? So we started out with the original ask for the vehicles. Um, one of the vehicles was a multifunction bus for athletics and one was a handicap van. Um, the multifunction bus for athletics, we do not have small enough teams to be able to utilize that vehicle to make it cost effective to actually purchase that vehicle. So we had cut that already. Um, so by the time we even went to the capital committee, I had already told them that we're, we're cutting that ourselves. Then we reduced the uh, handicap van to really just be a regular van. The handicap van that we have now will maintain and re and, and be able to utilize that. So if we have a student that's in a wheelchair, we'll use that van, and this van will give us that flexibility to just take additional students. Gotcha. Um, so. Kitchen equipment, we'll just continue to replace as we can and, and keep moving forward. Um, 
you know, with the hopes that eventually, again, as we catch up on some of this equipment, then we would be able to maintain replacements within that kitchen account um, without having to come for capital. I understand. So you feel comfortable with these, you'll meet the immediate needs that you're anticipating? Uh, you know, again, it, we have a backlog, um, but this will continue to move us forward. Right. And in related to the backlog, um, if you say again project with the kind of gap that you have in terms of the quality of these equipments or the necessity for upgrades or maintenance and whatnot, and map it with the growth that you're projecting, uh, do you know what the overall gap is and the picture for that gap and say, okay, this is our gap and over this many years we are going to capture or recover this and this will be the impact on the ongoing operations budget as uh, Rebecca was mentioning. A lot of it actually needs to be part of the operations in many ways, right? Because this is an ongoing maintenance. So do we ha have that clear view of things or it's more band-aid as, as we go? And I know you are doing the best to manage it within the budget, but I want to kind of tie it with the larger picture as well. So the larger picture of growth, um, I think you're really going to be looking at a building project um, mm -hmm. because the, the Elmwood School, as a, as a for instance, even replacing you know, a lot of that HVAC within that building, that building is very difficult to um, get up to the educational technology and what needs to be in a 21st century building for education. So I think that building, if you set that aside, the other buildings are in, are in better shape. Mm -hmm. um, but there are some basic things that have to be done to Elmwood to maintain the, the safety and health of the students that are in the building at the current time. Um, so, you know, we'll just continue. I don't have a number, you know, um, to be able to publicize that at, at this time. Um, but, you know, there are some things that need to be done over the next couple of years, just replacing equipment that has just been shut down. Sure, yeah, and this looks like the indication or indicators for that, right, mm -hmm. in some ways. Now, the assessment that you are also looking at, is that going to cover all these kind of um, uh, understanding and evaluating where things are, or what is the scope of that assessment? I'm sorry, which assessment? Uh, I'm sorry, I The sorry? capacity study. Oh, the capacity, yeah, capacity study. study. sorry. So the capacity study yeah. is just that. It's just capacity. It's not looking at building condition. Um, if we were to do both building condition and capacity, it would, it would be twice that in terms of cost. Yeah. Okay. okay. And just a reminder, I like to say this, when we were looking at building Fuzznaw Marathon, it was going to be the fourth school. We weren't planning on retiree center because of overcrowded. And I think you've already exceeded the numbers that we were expecting um, when we were looking for the fourth school. So just if I want to put it that there, get people used to that. <laughs> Uh, got it. Thank you. Yeah, I think looks like at one point you would want to do that as well. Uh, yes. I mean, on the go or at kind of overall assessment of these things. Any other questions on uh, Todd? What's up? Thanks. So I have one one last question or comment. This is just continuity year over year. So last year, you came before the Appropriations Committee with the turf fields, and that was a $3.5 million project. And part of the agreement to this project that this, there was going to be a fundraising effort for $500,000 to the fields. And I was just wondering, I'm just annually asking, how, how is that progress going on that? So there's actually, there's a, a group of people that have worked very hard in approaching a number of local businesses, uh, and they they are not at the $500,000, but they are working diligently. Okay. It has been more difficult than anticipated to get the money after the project is built, but they are continuing to pursue that very actively. Okay. Any idea how much progress they've made? I don't have the numbers off. Yeah, just, just to keep in mind, we were talking about it, that how to really, like you said, it is harder, but they were committed to doing this, and, yeah. and that kind of the agreement was that there was a phase A and phase B, and that in order to do phase B, you were going to, before phase B would be considered, you'd get to the 500,000. So I'm just curious, you know, what, do you have a, what's the plan in place, or, or I know it's difficult, but is there, you know, 
the library went through this and, and they really you know worked hard to do it and it took quite a while and uh, and they probably have some good recommendations there but we're seeing that now that for the last two years they you know that's been a revenue source that really has helped pay the debt and as you can see by the struggles in this in our budget as, as we've been hearing today or, or earlier that everything really is important you know for the, the, the burden of the taxpayers so I just wanted to bring that up and, and if you do have a plan that would Thank you. we'd love to hear it and uh, so I can get back to you with more specifics because I'm not involved yeah. in the fundraising, but they are. I know that they are working very hard and that they okay. are continuing with different avenues. So that's great to hear. Yeah, thank you. That's all I have. All right. Thank you. All right. Thanks. Thank, thank you. you. Mm -hmm. And to make the minutes easier for you, Todd, those few, the slides you just attached them with the minutes. Good job. Thank you. That's what I was going to do. Yeah. Good job. Thank you. Hmm? That's fancy. <laughs> <laughs> You're doing the minutes. Yeah. No, yeah, I, the 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 uh, <laughs> <laughs> I hope Thank that's good with everybody. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 Information would be real value yeah. to me. That's yeah. the biggest. Yeah. 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 That's big. The turnover is also it's huge. Yeah, that is the turnover. Yeah. 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 Yes. Good night. Good night. Everything was in shorts. Okay. Okay. So, so I don't believe we had any other departments tonight. Is that correct? That was it. it was just the schools tonight. That's correct. And the only other thing that we would have to talk to you about is the uh, file that I sent out yesterday, and I sent you two copies and sent it, shared it with everybody else. That was an alternative view of the sources and uses. And this is simply a presentation idea for the Appropriations Committee mm -hmm. re report does not have to be adopted it's just a mm -hmm. different way of looking at it uh, when I came in and looked at the format what I realized is that we present the budget to the public in a way that is uh, structured around the way the Department of Revenue computes tax rules and it's not the most informative thing for the average taxpayer because it never really shows you what the, the gross spending number is and it never really segregates the uses and sources of funds. For example, although the Department of Revenue likes you to set aside debt, I, I view the $8 million we spend on debt as a use of funds. We're spending the money, we're raising the money, we're spending it on debt, and that should be kind of highlighted. So this is just one possible template for an alternative presentation that really groups what I think would traditionally be considered sources up in the top part of the revenue section mm -hmm. and then the presentation of the uses should be pretty familiar to you because it has the six main categories underlined uh, culture and recreation education public works and then things like employee benefits and our contributions to the stabilization funds uh, the only other thing I added was there seems to be there is a lot of interest in how spending relates to uh, the tax base. So I tried adding a little uh, section on the top that talked about how the property tax base it, it plays into raising the amount that gets raised from property taxes, which is the lion's share, 72 million out of the 90 million we're spending, uh, and just try to show that link, just an informative uh, way to look at it. So it's not a form you would fill out for compliance purposes with the Department of Revenue, but it's a different way to look at how we present our sources and uses of funds. And there's a movement across the country to produce popular annual financial reports, PAFRs, that are aligned more like this than like the arcane structure of the DOR filing requirements. So, uh, you know, if you went to... Uh, trying to explain your business to someone, you would probably never give them your tax form. You would give them statements that present the business more clearly. So this is just an idea about how we might uh, present our, our uh, sources of funds and uses of funds in a more direct way that shows the link to the tax base. And I'm wide open to suggestions, comments, we could do what we did last year. We could stay with the old format. This is just 
uh, putting it out as one possible opportunity to do something a little differently I'll tell you I opened it um, thinking that it had to be useless and the old form had to be better but I like it Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Thank you. Yeah. So it's it, it's just more what you would expect to see. Mm -hmm. yeah. 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 No, it's definitely you can you can see the trail of where the numbers are coming from and um, you know how how you're deriving everything. Mm -hmm. So Great. it's much more understandable. I, so I agree. It's, it's so cool. if you, if you like this approach, we might expand it out to do the multi-year view in this format. Mm -hmm. uh, in the past, we've done the projections. Really, we're really <laughs> we're really going now. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so, I don't see like stuff like new growth and stuff like that on this. Which so, I think so that's interesting information, and it's mm -hmm. in the DOR revenue, right? Because it's all geared to the the tax levy caps. And, and in developing this, I would kind of say we need to present that data somewhere. Mm -hmm. But that's really kind of insider baseball. Mm -hmm. The fraction of people who track the new growth and unused levy and and you know the base impact I think is a, a smaller subset of the public than the people who want to know how much you're spending and what you're spending it on. Yes and no. I mean I, I agree that it's probably a smaller set, but I think they're very tuned into that. And the fact that we've had two under rides tells you that people are tracking the excess levy pretty closely. Right. Or not two, we've had one and we're proposing another one. Um, and I think to show the new growth too shows that even though people see, you know, legacy farms and all the development as a pain, it actually does bring in revenue it as does well. Bring in so half, there is half, the, more, yeah, more than half yeah. of the revenue we're raising this year. So even a, you know, just to kind of let people understand that again, maybe not on this page, right. I think it would it would, you know, make yeah. this page a little more complicated, but somewhere to include that, that's it. a great comment. Mm -hmm. uh, we'll we'll go back and we'll look at this top section and see if there's a way to integrate that without losing it. And the, the trade off you always have is how busy do you make the page and how much does that detract from the from the readability. Right. But and then maybe it's right. a separate page that just has, right. you know, has that, that recap. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So we'll work on that. Mm -hmm. So for comparison's sake, which was the old page? The old page is on the printout. Uh, the first page, the first page of that. The uses. Yeah. The first page of that file that we talked about earlier. So yeah, page one of your printout, and I can pass my copy around. Okay. okay. It's just a little. Oh, it's it just a general. Call out the new growth, the very front page. Yeah. yeah. Okay. And it does call the out the new too. growth, but otherwise, yeah. everything is kind of, mm -hmm. you know, like. Debt isn't really viewed as a cost, which is, it's, it's a major cost. Yeah. It's a, yeah. And it's something we really will be focused on in the coming years, mm -hmm. how the debt relates to the operating budget. Yeah. You, you do have the unused tax levy on this. Yes, and we had some discussion about whether that was half a loaf <laughs> and whether it shouldn't be on there because it was half a loaf. So, what, and what uh, do you mean by half a loaf? Well, he, uh, my colleague Dave, who I always listen very carefully to, suggested that I, if I was going to say that much about the unused tax levy, I needed to say a lot more mm -hmm. and be very clear. So actually, I have a copy in front of me where I've taken off that little reference mm -hmm. to the unused tax levy because it's really, that's really about, and, and how I explained it to Dave, my, my thinking about it is, the whole thing about the tax levy is a question of whether your budget is compliant or not. And all that calculation just tells you that you're producing a compliant budget or not. Mm -hmm. And it's not central to the story. This is a compliant budget. Right. And it's under the ceiling. Mm -hmm. And so to, to have a big discussion about how it's mm -hmm. compliant. Uh, well, and it changes too after the budget's it passed because then you right. set the tax rate and then that actually. That's right. Varies. And then, of course, yeah. the tax, these are estimates of the valuation. Right. So that'll change too. Mm -hmm. But uh, I was trying to show some representation that would show the scale, really. People seem very interested in the scale of the residential uh, taxpayers as a proportionate to the burden. Yeah. And there seems to be a lot of interest in that. And it seems like we ought to take opportunities to highlight what that ratio looks like. Mm -hmm. Just by glancing at this section, you can see that we would have to have massive growth in the industrial sector 
to have any impact on the residential, right? Yeah. Because it's so so disproportionately small. Yeah. Which is typical for a town like this. We yeah. these the towns towns don't have big industrial bases and don't have big commercial bases mm -hmm. generally. It's the cities that have that base. Yeah. So this slide's your Westboro or Natick. That's what we were saying. Or, or, saying. or, or maybe yeah. Foxboro, yeah. right? Yeah. Yeah. With the stadium. Yeah. So yeah. so it's not a universal but mm -hmm. So this is in addition to the other slide or instead of? Because I think this is a good breakout of that slide, but I don't, I like this slide because I need the numbers and, and okay. so. Well, it could I, be additional. I think it could be an additional because it, it's just another way of looking at it and that's beeficial, but you know, I like to know what changes year over year in various, you know, Absolutely, you, you and we should have the year over year presentation too, either integrated with this or separately. Uh, I guess part of where I'm looking in the longer term is I'd really like us to produce a four or five page thing every year that's an abstract of the appropriations report that would be a popular report, mm -hmm. a very thin product. Uh, Concord does it, Lincoln yeah. does it, mm -hmm. uh, Lexington does it. Uh, Do you, can you get us copies of those just to see? Sure, absolutely. Yeah, yeah, send you some that'd links. Be great. And it's uh, something that's sponsored by the Government Finance Officers Association. Mm -hmm. they, they do uh, have guidelines for how to do yeah. it. And, and then, you know, that's this year. And ideally, what people are doing is putting more performance data in with there. Mm -hmm. So you have in one place some very high level financial information and some high level performance information. And that really has a lot of benefits. It gets everyone thinking about the link between spending and performance. And, uh, you know, in the federal system under GIPRA back in the 90s started on that path. And you can open any federal budget now and you'll see the budget in terms of performance goals. So for the Coast Guard, it's maintaining navigation, search and rescue, drug interdiction. And the budget is actually framed against those performance metrics. And so it's, uh, it's a trend. And it's, we put out a lot of data. Mm -hmm. And we're really looking at it to see how much of it is usable information. Right. So when you go to town meeting, you get all different types of people. You have those who don't have an idea about how the budget works or what the numbers mean. And you have those who go count by count and knit and pick every little detail and they want to know the details. So if you don't put the details in, we're, we're hiding something. Yes, sir. And so it's that's why you, you, you just have to, yeah. it's better, it's good to accommodate Multiple Everyone, views. so it's right. like you're just trying to yeah. so uh, us. add this yeah. and then yeah. yeah. So I worked for an admiral, and he said everything is like a cube, and you have to turn the facets, and you need to explain it on five different facets of the cube at yeah. least if you want to uh, get your point across. And well, and it, it'll be. I think it'll be funny the reaction this year. The uh, the parking lot cost the additional three hundred thousand after four hundred thousand was approved last year. One of the big things that town meeting goes nuts over is and, and they kind of oppose each other is you know they want your number to be accurate when you come and ask the first time right but the other thing is they don't want to pay money for a study or a consultant <laughs> right. right so <laughs> right. you know so they want you to come with an accurate number but you know, I'm not really sure how you get that without paying some kind of money for you know someone to do that study and, and bring a professional in so it'll be interesting this year when uh, when that goes in I think people do it by radically overestimating and then claiming victory. Uh, I don't know. I don't know if there's another way to do it successfully. Yeah. Well, the history of this one, I think the first year was $180,000 to build the parking lot, and that was a no-brainer because it was going to save 100000 a year. And right. they're like, and I think the first year was like, let's approve the money before we even get any estimates because that's how good it is. And, right. and every year it kept going up and up. And uh, I, I, so now we're at a seven-year ROI. That's right. I believe exactly. it's seven exactly. years, yeah. but uh, yeah. it's, it's like still beneficial, yeah. but not as good as it was uh, yeah. four Which is why you had good four years questions ago. about... Well, yeah. yeah. You know, I want to know, are we going to grow so much that we're going to have to put another building yeah. there? <laughs> you know, I know it's not big enough for a building, a standalone building, but you know, are we going to regret this five years from now? So, Tim, I think one of the most impactful slides, at least I saw in the past few years, was this one slide, probably seven years ago, five where it listed all of the proposed building projects and the impact. And I just, it, it, there's a lot of buzz in town about it. What, what, what do you see as sort of the, the, this type of, you mentioned a future projection. I guess, what do you see that, this type of schedule going forward? 
So uh, last year's appropriations report showed some past years and some future years and just had more columns to the right. But I don't think those projections are made with great appreciation for the capital spending. I think they're probably mm -hmm. made pretty rough estimates of capital spending. And I think that's probably what we can do this year with a brand new team. Uh, we're really talking about our view of the whole debt life cycle, which goes now out to 2047. And we can see how that debt tails off and that cone is above the debt that we're paying off is your opportunity to either recapitalize yep. or to lower spending by lowering that top line, or maybe you want to raise spending and recapitalize more. But that's really the view we need is that. Exactly. Now to 2047 view that looks at what's going off the books, and then you start to plug in. This is where uh, the next new school goes in. Mm -hmm. This is where the major infrastructure <coughs> project goes in. Uh, or this is where t you know we absorb uh, we absorb inflationary costs out of that money and just uh, don't do more capital spending. But that capital spending is the heart of the long term view, and we really have to. Uh, our, our big opportunity is to do a better job at that than anybody else does. Yeah. That's what can set us apart. So. And for that team, we need that view of what are the big item things we need to do in the next five. Exactly. 2024. Exactly. School. So we right. heard. Yeah. Exactly. And how it fits into that. And you have to fit them into the one construct. And it, mm. you know, I think it seems that now what I've seen so far is that several departments do their own planning, and it's, some of it's quite good, but it's all different, and none of it's integrated. Uh, and it doesn't really take that long horizon that it could. So that's something we really want to work on in the next year. Well, what happened to the plan that, that was put together, uh, Norm? Um, the camp capital asset management plan. I know it's been a while now. 2012, I had it on my desk. Yeah, um, yeah 2012. I think it was 2012. It's, it's yeah. So seven problem. years ago, that's... Yeah. yeah, it needs to be updated, mm -hmm. one. And then number two, we need to tie that whole process to the CIEC process as well, because we have Absolutely. two separate yes, we have two separate processes. Yeah. yeah, and then we have department heads acting maybe outside that process, yeah. and we have boards acting outside that process. Well, so really, to, to it's it's really a great opportunity for us to to take a longer view and do better planning and understand where our windows of opportunity are. And then of course there's going to be business cycles in that, right? So we have these projections that are all very linear and they don't uh, reflect the business cycle. So we need to have agility as we move forward in, in implementing the plan too. It was definitely very helpful uh, in the past that the town wants to know what a plan, every year we just said, oh, we want to do this. Here's, here's something for Elmwood School coming up. And they were, how is this in the plan? We just keep on coming. We have to have it now. We're overcrowded. and they, they the town really wants a plan, and and the camp really helped um, with that. So it just needs to be. I think it went out like ten years, but right. I think it just needs to be updated, as as we were saying. So we're going to look at it very carefully. Yeah. Yeah. That's a good slide. Yeah. The school comes off very slowly. Yeah. Yeah. Tim, just curious, uh, quick question. The revenue you used to get from the EMC um, tax base, right. has that changed over the last couple of years? The EMC tax revenue. Not much. Not much. Buildings are still there. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah. I would expect I that. think the water, the you know, it's more impactful on the sewer system. Yeah, the water and so Because they've started energy conserving uh, measures that have dramatically reduce their use of water. Uh, so the, the biggest impact there has been on the sewer program. Mm -hmm. Which everybody's for water conservation yep. unless you're running the sewer system. Mm -hmm. so. <laughs> <laughs> so we have next Wednesday night. And we have uh, DPW and CPC. DPW and CPC. I was just, you know, as we were going over the schools, I just have a question on the, on the capital spending that I noticed. You know, we have 
a bunch of it that is, you know, on the, the last page is capital pay as you go, but then we have the section on capital borrowing. And I was a little, because um, when you saw the security camera, camera installation for the schools at $200,000, that's a borrowing. But I believe we've kind of been having security upgrades for the last six years for the schools, so it kind of the idea of borrowing 200000 where every year we kind of are putting in another, it is a, you know, just a, every year we're putting in 200000 It's one thing to be able to pay as you go, but to have that one in debt, be, especially if it's five years, because we're, for the last five years, we've been doing $200,000 a year to improve security in, in the schools. And it just seems like that's, what what's the point? The of borrowing, you know, if yeah, it's a recur, exactly. if it's occurring, you were, cause right. that's what Rebecca I was, was talking about yeah. uh, in the op, you know, you should put recurring items in the operational budget, right. but here is something we're recurring items we're borrowing on. Yeah. And it's, it's uh, the, it's, yeah. Even if it was a swap out with something where we have pay as you go, to right. me, in my mind, I would say that's a better, you know, pay for these recurring things well, as that, you yeah. go rather than. Um, Again, the, the original budget submission had that under pay as you go. However, in the process of this, Todd, <laughs> um, we had to move some of these uh, items to borrowing. <coughs> to get the 6-3. Yeah. Yes. 6-6-3. Um, for, for to keep the tax <coughs> Yeah. But essentially that means this is a little bit of <laughs> deficit in the budget, right? It seems like you're, yeah. actually borrowing to run the operations. And spending more than it's the maintenance in some ways. So, so I, I think though the, the security cameras are slightly different because this is not going to be an ongoing expense for the next 10 years. I think this is the final phase in the implementation of this project. However, your point though is well taken that when we do this, mm -hmm. at times then we are simply shifting um, the burden, our funding, yeah, yeah. the bed, and, and, and creating a deficit indirectly. So who takes a look and sees if that makes sense? I mean, if we're going to borrow and in the long term it's going to cost us more, then should somebody be suggesting that maybe we need to increase the operational budget to save money down the long term? No, we're, 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 we're past that stage. The selectman asked us to reduce the budget down to 2.5. Then what is our role? <laughs> I mean... Well, to, it's an important point that it's going to we do have some input on mm -hmm. whether uh, you know you have this under they want to do a, you want to do an underwrite next right. year and, and and we are very aware of all the things that are getting pushed off um, even though I, I brought up about the library funding four hundred thousand even though that's for a debt exclusion mm -hmm. but it still impacts the overall you know if it's not going to be the prop two and a half part of the budget the overall impact, unless you have enough new growth, new new growth mm -hmm. to right. exceed that, it, it's going to be more and more difficult for the taxpayer down the road if, by doing that. But yeah, we've been doing you know the, some things borrowing, some are pay as you go. And over the last ten years, I believe we've tried to do more paying you as you go because our free cash has been greater, mm -hmm. which is a good thing. It gives us usually gives us that flexibility to we can put something off if we don't have. The free cash, right? That we had right. For Rebecca, in, in terms of you know what our role is, you know, I mean, I <laughs> certainly understand that question, yeah. and I think that I, in, in my interpretation, our role is really to take a look at the guts of the budget at a lower level than the board of selectmen, and um, and make recommendations to them if we feel that you know it's it's the appropriate thing to do. Right. So, and and they may or may not accept those recommendations. Um, but you know, I guess that's what I see, and then also make the recommendations to town meeting too. Mm -hmm. And so, make it clear in, in, fa in fact, if, if 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 I may, I've I've been thinking about this question for a long, long time. I think Todd very well said, but slightly differently. The appropriations committee's role is to prepare a report for town meeting on the budget proposed by the selectmen. In the course of preparing that report, the Appropriations Committee can make recommendations mm -hmm. to the selectmen for any adjustments that you may deem necessary. I've seen this work over the years. 
However, I think it needs to be said that, um, at least in my eyes, I see your role as similar to the Ways and Means Committee, where you're basically looking at, here is the expenditure plan um, for the community. What does this really mean in terms of the now, which is the current f uh, the, the fiscal year that we are planning for, and the future? Mm -hmm. So, when you comment about the sources and the uses, um, you may make observations relative to, here's how this is done this year, but looking at the long-term impact, you may consider adjusting how it's done, mm -hmm. doing it differently. I mean, we've been bringing up some very good points in the last couple of sessions that, you know, to really get this down to two and a half percent, where inflation over the past year has been three percent, mm -hmm. we're, 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 take, we're getting rid of stuff, or in the case of what we're doing, we still want the stuff, but we're kind of pushing the costs down the road, and, and we, can, we can see that. People going to town meeting aren't going to be aware of that, but right. that's why I, I want to give a you know, the overview to, to at town meeting that right. those are the messages we can mm -hmm. take and whether people listen or not is up to them, but it's a pretty important message and we show that in our, mm -hmm. you know, in our, you know, in our, in our charts, people, some people do notice it and, and it will come up, but this is, right. So, and we this, don't have to talk about this now, but I mean, I feel like last year we said, look at we're not funding the OPEC as much as yeah. we want to. I didn't see anything that necessarily changed how we're funding it this year. So how is our input then, if it's supposed to be for future years, actually being documented and considered when budgets are considered in the future year? I think we have to keep hitting that point because ultimately it's the Board of Selectmen who are making that decision. And when we had our was it November meeting or October meeting, we said we need to fund OPEB. It started off at mm -hmm. 800,000, good intention, but as soon as the budget goes down to from 5% to 3% to 2.5%, something has to give. And, and yeah. they seem to, instead of, you know, uh, class sizes of 25 or 30, they want to keep the class, you know, it's more mm -hmm. important to keep the class sizes. And those are the decisions that are being made. Yeah. But um, yeah, that's, yeah, but we, but it's important to keep, be consistent with these messages, mm -hmm. even if it is year over year. And, and yeah. you get to have, you start to have a theme. <laughs> Yeah, exactly. <laughs> and, right? Exactly, and, uh, yeah. Yeah, I think, I think it's our analysis and our oversight uh, leading to our recommendations as well as making the communication so the selectman understands it as well as the town's highest legislative, which is the town meeting, they get the flavor of, you know, the challenges and yep. how yeah. the mechanics are impacting them. So then would we want to, again, not tonight, um, but consider whether or not we want to make a recommendation on this year's budget to the selectmen if we think there's something that I think that's something we need to discuss yeah. absolutely yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. um, I mean if we're going to have any if, if we're going to have any chance at having any impact mm -hmm. if we think an impact is needed right. you know, it's the only way to do it right. um, you know as we all know not a whole lot changes on town meeting floor exactly exactly yeah you know especially when it comes to the budget so mm -hmm have to try to do something ahead of time. As far as, as, far as your other point, um, you know, I mean, I think, I personally think that um, we as a group need to, tr we need to try to be more involved in the budget process from an earlier point uh, in the process. And I know that, you know, the chairman is, you know, part of the budget advisory group or whatever we're calling it these days and that type of thing, but, um, the the earlier the earlier we as a group can start getting ID our, our eyes on um, you know potential budgets as you know right as the board of selectmen is taking a look at them um, you know then we can start asking questions and we can you know uh, yeah. raise concerns mm -hmm. and, and things like that okay. so that when the board of selectmen has one of their meetings and says yeah you know let's cut OPEB from eight hundred down to four hundred. You know, someone can raise their hand, or, or mm -hmm. we as a group right. can say, "Hey, they did this this week. Do we want to? Do we want to make it some type of a recommendation?" Yeah. Mm -hmm. That's my opinion. Mm -hmm. And I know that I know that you know what our job is is to take the budget that the board of selectmen is approving and trying to move forward and evaluate that. But 
if there's going to be any type of an impact or put, you know even potentially I think it needs to be raised at an earlier point mm -hmm. yeah. I wanted to um, thank the chair for uh, you know asking the question on the um, the five hundred thousand dollars on the turf fields um, that uh, I mean, as far as I could tell you know last year they were supposed to pretty much be free fields right um, what so so that that component paying off that debt service is that fall does that fall on the school's budget or in the town's side of the budget town town budget town town budget town budget town sign. yeah okay um, and how much how much is that costing us annually right now uh, roughly of the fields I don't have, do you have the individual yeah we don't we don't have that we'll, we'll say yeah we'll send the information tomorrow okay. Yeah. Thanks. No, but generally when we do have these big projects, and that's always part of the, all right, if you will raise this, we do this, it's been done over the years, and, and I just think it's important that, you know, the library definitely, I don't know if they had professional fundraisers, but they definitely had an organized method year over year to, to I know they started at $2 million and but at least they got to you know raise one million dollars because two million dollars was really hard and but you yeah know, to show well that. you know and they and they started much earlier and you know it wasn't something where they were coming in and saying let's build the library this year right um, to town meeting so it was something that they had more runway um, I think it's great that um, you know the group that's working on it is still you know working hard I know some of the people who are on it on that uh, committee and. You know, there's no doubt in my mind that they're that they're you know putting forth a lot of effort because they always do. Um, uh, but you know, I also I also look at that whole three and a half million dollar cost and you know where monies were coming from. I'd love to see you know how much we are actually spending on that, how much how much we took in loans, because you know even even money that seemed to be coming from an area that you know has money to give there were loans being taken out for that right. money and that's the upsetting part to me so anyway. All right, is there anything else we wanted to discuss tonight no sir no we have minutes Okay, Wayne uh, sent us some minutes. And, and at Dave, I apologize. I left your name off them. You all now have a copy with Dave. Okay, there. We have a great crew here to share everything. So thank you. So, okay. I emailed it to everybody about three minutes ago. It's the same same document with uh, with one name. Okay. Yeah. So it was sent at six o'clock. If everyone, people, oh, you just send it again? Yeah. Oh. Minutes ago. It didn't. Oh. The, the, the narrative didn't change. I just added. Uh, okay. I just added a name. Oops. All right. So it'll still be the same minutes we're approving. Yes. Um, uh, do I hear a motion for the minutes for March twenty-first? Uh, I don't yet. <laughs> Was it? Are we ready to review them if they just came out at six o'clock and two of us were actually in a meeting, or should we delay this till the next meeting? Well, we have a meeting on Tuesday. We can. Yeah, we can I would wait. suggest we do that so we actually okay. can review. Them. I'm sure they're fine, but just in the spirit of actually voting. Okay. For can we vote on tonight's minutes then? I'll just email them to you now. <laughs> <laughs> just here's the slide deck. Oh, we right? could pause for five minutes. Then. Okay. All right. I think uh, then we're probably ready to adjourn. Okay. Motion so to adjourn. Time. Second, second it. Second it. All right. Very good. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.